Hello, uh, my name is Thomas Johnson, and I'm the Curator of Performance and Moving Image with the Dunlop Art Gallery at the Regina Public Library. And I'd like to welcome you to this conversation series where we connect you with creators in our community and beyond. I'm coming from Treaty 7 territory currently, which is home of the Blackfoot Confederacy, including the Siksika, Gaina, and Pikani First Nations, the Sutina and Stony Nakoda First Nations, as well as the Métis Nation of Alberta, of Alberta Region 3, as well as uh, urban Indigenous and Inuit uh, people who make their homes in Treaty 7 territory. Uh, I'd like to thank on behalf of Dunlop, our key funders, the Canada Council for the Arts, the Saskatchewan Arts Council, Sask Lotteries, Sask Culture, and the Government of Canada. And it's my great pleasure to introduce Judy Anderson, our guest today. Judy is Nehewa from Gordon First Nation, Saskatchewan, Treaty 4 Territory, and an Associate Professor of Canadian Indigenous Studio Art in the Department of Art at the University of Calgary. Anderson's practice includes beadwork, installation, handmade paper, painting, three-dimensional pieces, and collaborative projects, all of which are deeply personal with a focus on issues of spirituality, family, colonialism, and Indigenous epistemological and ontological traditions. Her current work is created with the purpose of honoring the people in her life and indigenous intellect intellectualizations of the world. She has also had an ongoing collaboration with her son Cruz, where they combine graffiti with indigenous methodologies and has been researching traditional European methods and materials of painting. So thanks very much, Judy, for being here. And yeah, I thought if we could just start maybe with a bit of the work that you're um, producing currently. So I'm fortunate enough to be in the Alberta Biennial and we'll be showing work at the Rainy um, September, I think it opens on September 26th. So I'm creating work for that. Um, I'm doing, one of the pieces is a response to, I'm not sure if people are familiar with the, the Four Directions piece where I, beaded the, um, giving away my secrets, uh, beaded the, the colors of the directions in circles and they were, um, uh, cruise group put them in graffiti and then I beaded them. Um, the titles are There's Life in There and then in brackets is the direction that that color sits in. And so one of the pieces that I'm making for the Alberta Biennial is um, a response to that. Um, I'll tell you the title, but I won't tell you what it says yet. Um, so it's a uh, square is not a circle and then the direction of the color. So a square is not a circle east and then carrying on so that it matches the, the color of that direction. So um, the title kind of tells you that it's in a square. And then I'm also working on a piece where I'm collaborating with um, Cruz. So he'll be making work and I'm making work. His work is um, gold leafed. And then my work, I'm going, I'm beating in copper. So I'm just going to pop up a quick image. But I'm not going to show you this. It's like in progress. So this is the <laughs> beginning of it. And it, it has uh, words at the bottom. But um, yeah, so if you visit the exhibition, you'll be able to see it. So that's what I'm working on currently, kind of secret, being secret. <laughs> and we see a piece of uh, your collaboration with Cruz in the background. Could you talk a bit about that, your collaboration with him and... Oh, like how it started or that piece specifically, or what would you? I think all of it, but let's maybe we could start with this piece and then uh, how that process has been over, over time. So um, a lot of people like the, the fortunate thing is that anybody from Saskatchewan or Regina probably know, or knows this, this story, but it actually came from a fast um, where I was told that I needed to honor Cruz. And so the best way that I knew how to honor him was by creating work for him. So was like the biggest gift that I could give him was to make artwork for him. Um, so what I, he was, when he was young, he started doing graffiti and I thought the best way to honor him was to make it, to blow up his, um, although if you think about a burner, it's very big, but his, um, his graffiti and put it into beads on this hide. So this is uh, the first one that I did, and I was thinking about it as an exploit robe. So an exploit robe would have been worn by a man and um, might have had drawings on it about the exploits that they'd done in war or hunting or in love. And um, you would wear it and um, people would be able to then tell 
some of the things that you did if they were familiar with the story or it acted as a mnemonic device to talk about how that um, what you had done in in battle or whatnot and so i was thinking about this about how now in contemporary times you know like that the warring and the hunting is definitely different but that um with graffiti it's similar in some ways because they're out there um making marks on the land or um doing these great deeds because it's um super important for people to be able to get up and get out without being caught or seen so i was thinking although he he hasn't done that um was to show like when he was 12 years old what he may have created if he had actually gone out and gotten up and gotten out. So um, that's his first uh, large burner that he would have done. And the title is Ex Exploit Robe Toying Around. And the word toy within graffiti culture means to be not good at it. So in this one, if you look at it and you're a graffiti artist, you would probably say, oh, is that ever toy? So it's not really a good um, graffiti piece, but it, the way I'm thinking about it is it's the beginning of his journey as a graffiti artist. And actually, if you look at it in terms of my beating, I'm still really toy at beating at that time as well. So there are areas that are popping out or that are crooked or I didn't know how I wanted the bead line to go. So it's kind of making this funny, you know, point of gathering in some point. So, um, yeah, so that's kind of how it started and what it's about. And then from there, we just continued our collaboration and making other works with graffiti in it. Cool. And how's that informed uh, each of your respective practices, I guess, going between beading and graffiti? Um, well, so what we both decided was that, like I wouldn't do graffiti because that's the skill that he has. So if you think about it, it might've been a good idea for me to learn how to, create letters and um, nice letters and whatnot, but that I kind of left that out. Um, I've taken workshops where I've been taught how to start with that, but I, I've never invested the time because I wanted this to be a true collaboration where Cruz came with that skill, right? And so Cruz has also learned how to bead and he, and he probably is not too bad, but he doesn't bead and he doesn't bring that skill. So he leaves that skill to me. So in terms of those two things, we've, we've kept them separate. Um, in terms of, uh, what we're doing, I think Cruz is like less, he does less graffiti now that he, he's older and he's actually does, um, academic realist, um, artwork. And, uh, every now and then when we feel like we need to say something or do something, we might move back into graffiti. Um, often what happens is that the, the stuff that we donate to fundraisers will bring both of those skills in because some people like that work. And so hopefully it'll fetch some money for, for uh, whoever has asked for a donation. Nice. nice. Yeah. So how do you find with your practice now um, working in, in this time that we're in uh, very charged politically and also with um, regards to COVID-19, how do you find, is, is that influencing your practice right now or your way of, ways of working? Well, um, I, I was thinking yesterday <laughs> as I was, it was a nice day outside and I was like, damn, I'm, I'm inside and I need to do work and I'm by myself. And I was thinking about this cartoon or this meme that made it onto social media where it was like an artist in the summer, like a regular person in the summer and they're all like tanned and all this kind of stuff. And an artist in the summer looks the same as an artist in the winter. <laughs> So I was thinking about how I like it hasn't changed for me because with beading, I, I really just sit at a table and I bead, right? Or I sit at whatever setup that I've created for myself. So the hide is, um, I beaded it on a quilting loom. And then the other stuff, so like this, the, this one here, I'm just sitting at a table. So and I'm by myself. And um, so that hasn't changed. Um, in terms of the politically charged climate, um, like, in terms of my own work, it hasn't changed how I'm working because I feel like that my work is always politically charged uh, in terms of, you know, where colonization and, and being indigenous and whatnot. Um, it's to, it's, but it's definitely giving me a lot more to think about, you know, how to, how to respond. It's difficult. It's difficult to answer that question because I think that, um, yeah, that, that, you know, as a white presenting person, I know my privileges in all of this. And then it's just thinking about what do I bring to the table to make sure I'm doing my job in all of this. 
And I think that I've been doing the best that I can with, with what I've got, but that there's still definitely more I can do. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 And in many ways it's, it's nothing, it's, it's nothing new where we've been in this time for, for quite, quite some time. Yeah. Like, like, um, you know, so I'm seeing things, you know, like when was the first time that you've experienced racism? And of course I can definitely tell stories about that, but also knowing that I have not at all had as much racism against me as other people who are not white presenting like I am. Mm -hmm. Right. But knowing, but also that I have suffered a lot of those things, just not to that degree. And how do you feel like now also you're, you're teaching at the university and like instilling that, that sense of, of political work for, for incoming students and building community. Um, and especially now, like when we are in these, these weird restrictive mm -hmm. contexts, how to, how to, how to build community, how to kind of work in, work politically as well in, in this time. You know, I, and for people, um, yeah. You're asking me difficult questions, <laughs> Thomas. <laughs> and it's not that I haven't thought about these things. It's just that how, like, I don't, I normally don't speak. I'm, I'm, I'm a behind the scenes kind of person. And so people might think you're not doing anything. I actually do. It's just that I like to do it quietly. And I like to kind of go over here and go over there. But um, I find that um, moving to the University of Calgary has been quite an eye opener for me mm -hmm. because I was at the First Nations University of Canada before. And of course that is, a, you know, um, an institution that is based on, you know, indigenous belief systems, indigenous thought, uh, a lot of indigenous faculty, a lot of indigenous students, um, you know, so where we would have 9% indigenous students in our class and 10% non, right? And now that's flipped for me. And it's been a really, it's, it's been a, it's a shock, I have to say, um, about the, how I had to change my teaching so that I'm doing the best that I can, right? And so there's, there's a lot, there's a lot that I need to do, but also I am doing stuff, you know, but that's without saying exactly what I'm doing. Because <laughs> I'm, I'm a behind the, th the scene person. <laughs> yeah, I think there's a lot that needs to be done. And it's, it's difficult. It's a difficult topic mm -hmm. and I'm sorry if I'm disappointing anybody with my answers, but um, yeah, I do better in a group situation <laughs> than like this. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> I, I don't have to ask you all the questions. You can also ask me questions if you want, but <laughs> okay. <laughs> much more interesting. <laughs> I find, and I don't know what your experience and I'll be coming into the, this position in, in Regina and in learning to build community and to understand the place, but how do you, find you you came to understand uh where you are now located there and what was helpful for you i would like to to come here and the things yeah. that were yeah. like specifically what give me an example um i guess like if you like, thinking about community and like building networks and friendships and um in i guess maybe also thinking about like how that plays into uh the work that you're doing you know um um coming to calgary has been really really um interesting for me because when I was at the First Nations University of Canada, I did a lot of administrative work. And so I didn't get to do a lot of my own research. And then at one point I stepped away from the administration and I started to work on my own, my own research. So I was able to get this done and then um, a few more projects. And so when I was leaving the First Nations U, I was just getting back into that, that work. And when I got to the University of Calgary, things were starting from that research I was doing at First Nations University, but now it's, there's a lot more being done. So I'm finding it hard to balance uh, all of the aspects of my job. So the, the teaching, the research, and then the service, right? So that it's kind of like a le an even thing. So I, I, I actually don't have a community in Calgary because I work all the time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like when um, I'm like, I'm not gonna work this weekend, but I'm actually beating all weekend. So when I say I'm not working this weekend, I mean, I'm not working on my teaching, I'm not answering emails, and I'm not working on my service, but I'm definitely working on research. So this is one of the reasons why I'm so sad you and Jesse are leaving because you're my only friends outside of work. You're my community, Tom. <laughs> well, I always have Zoom. Yeah. <laughs>
so really I don't know like I've been to the mountains a few times you know you're so close in the mountains and I've been to them a few times so and I've only been out to like a handful of um, community led things you know like at, at galleries and whatnot yeah. I haven't even seen like this is terrible no I shouldn't even tell you I haven't even been to the library yet and it's it's gorgeous I know right okay but ask me what I'm gonna do as soon as we're off the zoom <laughs> <laughs> what are you gonna do as soon as we get off this <laughs> Okay, well, I should probably let you get back to then, but we'll look forward to seeing you in uh, Saskatoon, I guess, at the Rimai. And yeah. uh, when is that? That was in September? Yeah, September 26th till Fe February 14th. Yeah, of 2020. Great. Thanks yeah. so much. Yeah. Okay. And, yeah Thank I'm you. Good. Thank you for having me. <laughs> of course. Yeah. Thanks. Um, so, yeah, thanks so much for tuning in, and uh, we look forward to more of these chats in the future. Thanks, Judy.